the first duty we have is to really inform ourselves about this technology, about how it works. The smartphone, social media and all that kind of stuff, it's designed to be addictive. There's no way that uh, AI or robotics is going to give any fundamental meaning. We published an article on AI about a week ago on our Premier Unbelievable website. It was written by AI. It just shows you how far this technology is coming. But it fooled you, John. Um, it so, certainly did. Yeah. So what, what do you think about all of this? Hello and welcome to today's webinar, our live show, How to Live Faithfully in a Technologically Confusing World. I'm Justin Briley, joined by Ruth Jackson as my co-presenter. And our special guest today is Dr. John Wyatt. John is a Christian physician and research scientist who hosts the Matters of Life and Death podcast for Premier Unbelievable and is author of the book, The Robot Will See You Now. We'll meet John properly in just a moment's time. But uh, thank you for coming along. And we always have viewers from all over the world. So do tell us where you're coming from uh, in the chat today. Uh, we'd love to know. Uh, do feel free to, to drop a message in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from. Um, uh, I should say, this feels like a really prescient uh, moment to be talking about AI. There's been so much on our news screens and media about AI and technology just recently. Uh, we do live in this this almost the world of sci-fi, it feels more and more. Uh, the world is being radically changed, I think, by the biotechnology, by AI. Um, and and we end up interacting, I think, often more with with digital programming than people a lot of the time. Um, so, John, welcome. You're, you're going to be helping us to navigate this strange new world, aren't you? <laughs> yes, it, it's a, it is an amazing time to be alive, and uh, but it, it's a deeply confusing time at the same time, isn't it? I should say as well, welcome to Ruth Jackson as well, Ruth. Hello. Welcome along. Hello. Good, good to have you with us too. You'll be helping to, to, to put the questions to John tonight. Um, how was Christmas though, John? How was New Year and all, all of that sort of thing? Yeah, thanks. We had a, a pretty non-digital analog Christmas meeting family and uh, grandchildren. Uh, my wife and I, we've got four grandchildren. And uh, so it was, it was a lovely family time, actually. And it's nice to be able to put the devices down for a bit, isn't it? But uh, now back in January, it seems like the whole thing is starting up again. <laughs> It does, yeah. The, the world gets back into its yeah previous and, and ever faster rhythm, it feels like. Um, but anyway, tonight we'll be able to talk about, about all that. Um, Ruth, do you want to tell us where some of our, our viewers are joining yeah, from? Yeah, I mean, they really are from all over the world. We've got Brazil, Sweden, quite a few people within the UK, Doncaster, Oklahoma. I'm aware that's not in the UK, <laughs> Kansas, um, Norway. Uh, apparently it raining southern california i didn't even think that was a thing. rainy southern california i know it's very don't hear that very often no i know how very british of us to be talking about the weather again uh baltimore charleston all over the place uh yeah more north carolina wembley minnesota yeah lots well, uh, germany many many places nottinghamshire has just come in yeah Lots of people well, from well, welcome along wherever you wherever you're tuning in from. We're so glad to have you um, for this our first live show of 2023. Um, you've been actually you and your journalist son Tim um, part of the Premier Unbelievable Network for nearly a year now. Um, the Matters of Life and Death podcast joined us, I think, in March last year. Tell us a little bit about that particular podcast. What's it about? What do you talk about? Yes, I mean it's great to be part of the uh, the Premier. Uh, team. I, we started this podcast, my son and I, uh, actually at the time of the pandemic when uh, both of us were unable to travel and it was really a bit of an experiment. But uh, every week we have a, uh, a discussion uh, and it's pretty wide ranging. It started off mainly to do with medical things, particularly to do with the pandemic. Lots of issues coming up about you know, the, the virus and about vaccines and so on. But we've gradually extended to really anything which is either uh, medicine, healthcare, technology, science, uh, and related issues, trying to, to think through and discuss uh, some of the challenges, trying to understand what's going on in this confusing world. And then how on earth do we go about trying to m make some kind of response from a Christian yeah. perspective? And, and it's got a lovely sort of father and son dynamic to it as well. I like I like that that it is presented by a father and a son. Um, and I always come away from every episode learning, knowing things I didn't know when I started and, and having obviously your your own wise counsel to, to think through them as well. So thank you for it. 
Um, uh, and of course, there's a book as well, isn't there? Um, so so th this was the, the robot will see you now. That was your last major published book, wasn't it? That's right. Um, so this came out from a research project that I was uh, a part of. I've been fascinated by artificial intelligence for a number of years, and um, I managed to persuade the Faraday Institute uh, based in Cambridge that this was a, a good topic for a research project. And uh, I got together a whole bunch of, of scientists, uh, theologians and so on. And, and eventually we wrote this this book um, tackling a whole range of, of issues based ranging from science fiction, theology through to practical things like sex robots and employment and healthcare and so on. John, we've heard lots about some of the challenges and opportunities of AI, um, but you think that this is the moment in our culture where Christians actually have an opportunity to sort of stand up and be clear about what it means to be human. Would you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I've been involved in areas of science and technology, uh, starting from my background as a as a medic um, uh, over many years. And, and the interesting thing is each time technology advances, it seems to go back to raise this fundamental question, what does it mean to be human? Mm. And often it's raising it in a new way where we haven't quite thought of before. And I think it's artificial intelligence and robotics, which is raising that question in a new way. What does it mean to be human? And the interesting thing is that a lot of scientists, a lot of just ordinary people are actually asking the same question. Um, and of course, as Christians, we do have a wonderful and profound answer. Uh, the, the Bible gives us a, a, a rich understanding of what it means to be a human, both a wonderful thing made out of, uh, uh, made in God's image to reflect God's reality, but also made out of dust, incredibly vulnerable and, and weak and profound, and, and then fallen, affected by, by sin. So. I think this understanding of what it means to be human is has something very special to say in this world where where robots and AI are taking over. When it comes to some of the key players, you know, Elon Musk is obviously a name lots of people associate with the advance of technology and so on. Um, he's almost a you know perfect character to star in some James Bond film, isn't he? As a super super villain taking <laughs> over the world with his his AI on his his space rockets, but. Um, but what to what extent has sci-fi do you think kind of played into this whole revolution that we're now sort of living through yeah my conviction is science fiction is is far more important than most people realize and actually to be honest if you really want to understand what is going on including from a christian you read to, you need to read sci-fi because What's so interesting is that all the other technological revolutions that happen, things like, you know, uh, the age of steam and the development of electricity and all these kind of things, the technology comes first and then the novelists come along mm -hmm. and write mm -hmm. novels about it. So Charles Dickens writes about mm -hmm. the age of steam and the industrial revolution and so on. What's unique about this one is that for a hundred years, people have been writing and speculating about uh, artificial intelligence and particularly a, a lot of dystopian fiction about the machines battling against human beings and also utopian uh, worlds where the robots do everything and the human beings have nothing to do but enjoy themselves and most of the people who work in this field the scientists and technologists are themselves science fiction nerds and elon musk is a classic example and he has spoken about this repeatedly uh, uh, that actually he's trying to make the science fiction come true and, and that's why, you know, he read about electric cars. OK, so we've got to make electric cars happen. We've, we've read about ro rockets. And also now he's got a thing called Neuralink, where we connect mm. the human brain to computers. These are all science fiction ideas, which he is trying to make come, come real. Then what happens is the, the next generation of novelists come along and say, oh, that's a really interesting idea. They mm. read more novels and then and so on. There's a kind of feedback loop going on here. And I, I think, therefore, understanding the science fiction uh, is important and you know when we come to robots this is really important because there are so many robots in the novels mm. it starts with asimov mm. and even before then and these robots are all intelligent they've all got a kind of consciousness they're all planning and mm. scheming and and therefore when we meet a real world robot we can't help but putting that kind of science fiction gloss onto it e even if it's highly debatable whether a sentient conscious robot could ever exist i mean it's almost assumed in the sci-fi that's where it's heading and it feels like that 
that's been taken on by the Elon Musk. Well, of course, we're going to develop. Whereas that's that's not a given by any means, is it? Is it, John? No, it isn't. And, and actually, it's it's an incredibly complex and, and, and difficult issue. I've been trying to wrap my head around this issue of consciousness and, and robot. And it it's almost like you go down the rabbit hole because the problem is we only know about consciousness in a human being. That's our only experience of what it's like to be conscious comes from human beings. And even as I stare at you, Justin, I don't really know that you're conscious. I mean, you could be a zombie. You could be just going through the motions. Well, you could be the latest AI simulation, John. Oh, you, you very, didn't realise. You just, you just yeah. spotted me. Yeah. So the, sooner or later, there are going to be uh, AIs that claim to be conscious. And the interesting thing is there is no way that we can ever know for certain. Mm -hmm. There's no test for consciousness. There's no way. And... Some people are suggesting we're going to have to set up committees that are, whenever an, a new software program comes along and claims to be conscious, we're going to have to have committees which decide, is this actually genuinely conscious? If it is, we're going to have to treat it with, give it rights. We're going to have to make sure we uh, don't damage it or cause pain. Uh, we're not going to be allowed to switch it off, even if it gets on our nerves uh, and, and so on and so on. And people are seriously, um, mm projecting forward what what society is going to be like when we've got all these so-called conscious robots mm. well i guess that sort of raises the question of like, the role of evil so ros picard who's at mit and i don't know whether anyone saw this but she she did a big conversation with justin and nick bostrom and other scientists and she said which i thought was really interesting that people use a ai to amplify either the good or the bad things that they're doing so that I think raises the question of evil, doesn't it? You know, where is the role of evil in all of this, and and, and what what's kind of the church's responsibility in all of this, John? Do you think uh, that's absolutely right? And one of the fascinating things about the technology world and the world of of, of science and materialism is that they don't have a category for evil. It it doesn't really compute. They understand that there can be things like programming errors. They understand that there can be kind of just random things going wrong. But the idea that there is actually a malevolence that people or forces would want to do things in a, in a, in a genuinely malevolent way, it doesn't compute. I mean, why would that happen? Why would that happen in a world of physics? And so interestingly, it's, it's really, I think, Christians who do have a much deeper and, and a more profound understanding that evil is a real phenomenon but it's not this the supreme phenomenon it's not mm. you know the power of god the power of goodness is greater than evil but at the same time we've got to respect evil we've got to take it seriously we've got to recognize that evil can sort of emerge out of neutral technology and i, I think the most thing, the greatest thing we should be concerned of is not so much about evil robots or terminators. <laughs> what we should be concerned about is evil human beings who can use this technology for their own malevolent purposes. Yes. I mean, St. Paul obviously talked about the principalities and powers. And, and by that, you know, I think he was talking in Ephesians about the both the, the earthly powers and the spiritual powers. But I, I think today you could say, big tech is becoming one of those earthly powers it, it's something and and christians need to be ready i suppose to 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 understand that and uh, and respond to it appropriately i think that's absolutely right and and i think so far i'm afraid the kind of biblical theological thinking is way behind mm. uh, where where the technology is uh, and one of my frustrations is actually it's turned out to be pretty hard to get serious theologians and Bible scholars mm. to engage with this stuff. Most of them think it's just, it's for the yeah. birds. It's not serious. It's, yeah. It's yeah. It's still so just on. sort of it's, things people talk yeah. about online and, 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 but no, I mean, it is, and we're going to come in a moment to, to something that's just happened in the, in the last few weeks that, that a lot of people have been talking about chat GPT. Um, just a reminder though, before we, we talk about that, um, it's cause some people have been joining us as we've been having this conversation. You can ask your questions. Um, we're going to be coming to those questions in just a moment. This is a great moment to pop a question in the Q and A and we'll get to as many of them as we can during the course of today's show we'll put them to john here um 
we we published an article on AI about a week ago on our Premier Unbelievable website. It was titled, Should Christians Be Concerned About the Rapid <laughs> Advancements in Artificial Intelligence? I, I sent this to you the other day, John, just to have a look at it, see what you, you thought did. of it. You, and I thought, you, well, you, it's sort of, you know, you think? Yeah, go on. I, I thought it yeah. was, you know, it's not, it's not the best thing I've ever read, but, you know, <laughs> I've read other things written by Christians, which were far worse. I thought it was fairly balanced. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Okay. Middle of the road. Middle um, of the road. Well, and, and then we, of course, let the cat out of the bag with you, John. It was written by AI. Um, so we thought we'd just try this little experiment of seeing whether people twigged. And to be honest, I haven't seen anyone actually twig that this was written by AI. And it's just a, a, it just shows you how far this technology is coming. Now, we'd love to, to just demonstrate how we created this article, because lots of people have been talking about this new AI platform, ChatGPT. It's freely available. Anyone can go on it, register. And it's it's almost like magic what this program can do. <laughs> um, uh, you you put in your command, you write it in plain English. There's no HTML code or anything like that needed. And what you can see here is is the way that we created this by just asking it to create an article about 1500 words um, using quotes from a famous atheist, a famous Christian, include a Bible verse for reassuring Christians about the uncertainties of AI. Please also give this article a catchy title that will get people's attention, a single sentence summary of the article and so on, a made up name for the author. So you give the instructions and then look what happens. It literally just starts to write the article for you. Um, and you can do this on any subject. Uh, you can ask it to write um, a film script. You could ask it to create a recipe. You could ask it to plan a church service. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's all, you know, the possibilities are almost endless with this. And, and, and so this is an article that it wrote. Now, this isn't the article that we posted because actually when we came to record this, it, it wrote a different article, actually, arguably a slightly better article <laughs> than the first one. Um, but it's just, it's just kind of mind blowing. And, um, I should say it we we asked it to invent a name for the for the this uh you know the author it, it came up with Sarah Johnson from Stanford University but it fooled you John um it so certainly did yeah so what what do you think about all this <laughs> well it's, it's unbelievable isn't it because um you know if, if you had said 10 years ago that this technology would be able to just out of the blue um give quite a, a thoughtful, well-argued, sensible, apparently intelligent piece, uh, you would have said that that is science fiction. And, and it just shows you how predicting where this technology is going um, is is really problematic. And, and I mean, this is raising a lot of, of questions, all kinds of practical issues. Like, for instance, you know, if you get this to write your essay for you, I mean, why do you worry about uh, yeah both at school uh, university i mean, I mean you know, this is going to be an absolute nightmare for it is teachers, nightmare. isn't it I mean, it's, it's, is it plagiarism like, is it you know? <laughs> well it's not because it's not even if it was just copying and pasting bits of the internet that would be one thing but it's writing completely unique copy every time that's that's the point about it it, it is quite quite extraordinary um yeah i mean and what is I mean, extraordinary really, actually yeah, is, i mean I, I don't fully understand the technology but as much as i understand basically what has happened is that these programs have have gone across the entire internet and, and all languages scraping up literally billions and billions and billions of pieces of text but then the machine learning system basically analyzes it and and they have two two programs sort of competing against each other one program is trying to generate AI and the uh, text and the other one is is testing it and critiquing it mm. and what it's trying to do is predict what the next word will be in 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 all these billions of words right it's trying to predict what the next word will be and it keeps getting better and better at predicting what the next word will be and apparently it runs both forwards and backwards so it's not only predicting what the next word is going to be but it also <laughs> predicts what the last word was wow and eventually by doing this millions and millions and millions and millions of times it then produces this text in other words it mm. doesn't genuinely understand anything it doesn't have a database of, of information. It's some kind of weird mashup 
of billions and billions and billions of of mm. of text mm. and again the fascinating thing about this technology is that even the best computer scientists could not tell you why it wrote that particular sentence mm. it 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 in yeah. that sense it's completely it, it's a kind of a black serious. box almost it's a black isn't box. it yeah yeah well, I mean, there's no doubt that it's clearly ridiculously intelligent, but but and and really helpful in some respects. You know, Justin mentioned their sermons, things like that. I know a church leader who wrote just just as an experiment. He didn't use it, but a kind of <laughs> asked it for a order of service, and and it responded in 30 seconds with a liturgy, with sort of call and response, with hymns, with prayers, with Bible passages, with a short sermon. So there's clearly no doubt that it's really useful. But but is it just useful, or is it sort of evidence that humans are increasingly becoming unnecessary? Do you think? You know, are we all going to be done out of jobs because of <laughs> AI in the future, John? I don't think so, because actually every single word that that produced was written by a human in that sense it's not original at all it has simply statistically generated vast amounts of of text and because it doesn't understand anything it's perfectly capable of saying things which are completely wrong mm. it there's a medical term called confabulation which some people with brain injury do where they just you ask them a question and they invent a memory they just and it churns out and it's incredibly realistic but they're actually just confabulating and and that's what this does it it invents things that never happened it it it's invents conversations historical conversations events and so on and the other thing that is if you actually left this to do itself, it would spew out obscenities, sexual references, uh, hate speech, and so on. So there's a, a second process, which is an extraordinarily mm. detailed curation and uh, removal. And who's doing that? Well, of course, it's human beings and human moderators who are who are making sure that this will only generate acceptable text. Yeah, that that in a sense you always have to have a human at the other end to make sense of it because as much as we call it artificial intelligence, the the only real intelligence is is up here in our human exactly. mind where we can ascribe meaning to something. As you say, the AI has no idea what it's doing; it's just following a program. Um, yes, and, so, and so, I yeah. think as as we look to the future, yes, these things are going to get more and more apparently sophisticated, and we're going to find it harder and harder to tell what is genuinely human, but most experts think actually when it comes to real understanding real comprehension they're not getting anywhere um mm. and, and actually there's going to need to be a new breakthroughs fundamental breakthroughs in, in computer science and in cognition and, and maybe in philosophy before machines are ever really going to be mm. able to comprehend in the way that the human mind can well um as I mentioned, please do get those questions coming in. We'd, we'd love to have your questions to ask John for the rest of the programme today. Uh, just pop them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. Just before we go to a question, um, we'd like to say uh, thank you if you support the show. It makes a huge difference to us being able to bring you resources, podcasts like Matters of Life and Death, like Unbelievable, uh, all the articles we put out, the videos and uh, courses and so on uh, and if you're able to support us we've got a special link where you can click through uh, to make a gift and we've got a, a thank you for that as well um, and it's rather appropriate to our guest today because you'll receive if you're able to support us with the link uh, a special ebook edition of john's big conversation dialogue with lord martin reese this took place last year it was part of our big conversation. They were talking about robots, transhumanism and life beyond Earth. Uh, this contains the whole of their conversation, but it also has over 100 pages of bonus interviews and articles. So there's loads to get your teeth into there. And we'll send that to you as a thank you if you're able to support us. Uh, the link, as I mentioned, is with the, uh, the is in the chat. If you're with us live, if you're watching at a later date or listening, it's still available. Just go to the info with today's show and you'll be able to access it as well. And um, we'll send a follow up email as well with the link. So uh, that, that that's uh, we, we always value it whenever anyone's able to support what we're trying to do through Premier Unbelievable. Shall we go to our first question, Ruth? Yeah, let's do it. I'm going to pick this one first just because lots of people have liked it. Um, so this is from Luciana, John, and she says, I have been really worried about the 1984 dystopia when we see a rise of totalitarian regimes. How do you see that from a Christian perspective? What would you say to that, John? 
Yes, well, I think, to be honest, we have reason to be worried, at least from a human level, because um, this is really what's happening in certain countries across the world, particularly China. Um, what is happening is that um, the Communist Party, uh, communism generally, has always been concerned about social control and about um, how to keep a population controlled, how to monitor them and, and surveillance. And of course, um, George Orwell wrote 1984 based on his experiences of these very early totalitarian regimes. What's happening is that is that communist China is is continuing down exactly the same line, only now they're using this incredibly sophisticated technology. I recently read a book uh, which argued that what happened in the pandemic is that it was the ideal opportunity for the Chinese government to um, monitor their population at a new level uh, using the technology, uh, particularly smartphones, but also cameras everywhere, uh, motion detectors, face recognition and so on. And so the, the level of monitoring has gone up uh, at, at, to, a, to a, a new level and is carrying on post pandemic. Um, so, but the interesting thing is that America has almost as sophisticated monitoring and surveillance technology, but it's using it for commercial uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. So you've got these two major powers, both of them doing incredibly invasive surveillance. You know, our smartphones are just pouring out data constantly, uh, the internet and so on. And I think, I think we do have reason to be really concerned. Um, I, I think, again, the first duty we have is to really inform ourselves um, about this technology, about how it works. It's easy to point the finger at, at uh, China or Russia or other communist states, but I think we too are deeply manipulated uh, by this technology. And particularly, you know, the smartphone, social media and all that kind of stuff, it's designed to be addictive. It's designed to trap you and to, and there are some of the smartest people on the planet are devoting the whole of their attention as to how can we make it, how can we make it more addictive? How can we persuade you to spend more hours in front of a screen? And I think we need to inform ourselves about this, particularly as Christians, and to find ways to start to push back. And, and th that is beginning to happen. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, a number of people are starting to uh, make suggestions about how we can learn not to allow this addictive, dominating technology to, to damage our own lives and, and learn to push back. You mentioned that there are some people sort of speaking into this area, but how do we as Christians make sure that actually this technology is used for good and, and not for evil? What should we be doing as normal Christians who aren't perhaps AI experts, things like that? We obviously want those people speaking, but what do we do as normal Christians on the ground to try and ensure that this isn't happening? What's the, what's the church's role in all of this, John? Well, I think it's really important, but the truth is we've hardly begun. I said earlier that we're way behind the curve. And I'm afraid that that's the truth. You know, it's almost like people are now giving away free heroin <laughs> to everybody. And we've only just noticed that this might actually not be a, a good idea. And we're starting to see the consequences of people who've just been using heroin, 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 and starting to say, oh, hang on a minute. How are we going to, how are we going to respond to that? So I think the truth is that we're a long way behind the curve, but I'm not pessimistic. I do now see um, help. Going. I mean, I think we, as as uh, as just as ordinary members of churches, need to go to the church leaders and say, "Look, we need help. You know, can you put us in? Uh, can you direct us towards material? Could we invite someone to come and give a talk to our children? There are mm. some excellent materials around there. Maybe you know, just at the end, we could we could make a resource list of some books, materials, websites, which would help. Yeah, because I think yeah. it's a really important question. Yeah. Ruth. yeah. I mean, I almost like think of it a bit like it's not a perfect analogy, but, you know, when tobacco, you know, started to get into vogue and, you know, by the 1920s and 30s, 40s, 50s, everyone was was smoking. And then suddenly everyone realized this is really bad for you. You know, there's these health implications to smoking. And what was 
you know everyone uh, and everyone did it then it took decades but gradually people began to, to realize and the government started to clamp down and to you know m make it harder to to smoke and and so on and who knows maybe we'll see the same thing in the digital sphere that that as we understand just how this is affecting our minds and, and lives and so on it will just force people to 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 take that seriously and to make the changes necessary uh, even if it may you know feel like it takes a long time just one thing i would want to add and that is that historically down through the centuries of the christian church whenever things seem to be dominating our lives uh, things that were good in themselves but started to become too important christians understood that the concept of fasting of actually choosing to say mm. yes well food is good uh, but, I'm, but I'm going to have a period when I'm going to say I'm not going to let this become an idol. I'm not going to let it become dominant. I think we're going to have to learn much more about technological fasting. Mm -hmm. We're going, to, you know, to to say I'm going to detox for a period, maybe you know Sundays, maybe other ways in which we just say I don't allow this technology to control my life. I'm going to control it. Mm, excellent stuff. There are some great books out there as well. Um, here, here's one. Um, this one from uh, uh, John John Bainbridge um, wants to talk about consciousness um, and says, could you, for instance, grant that human consciousness is on a wider continuum of life form awareness? So I assume John's thinking, you know, that other animals have some form of consciousness alongside us. Uh, could robots be said to therefore be advancing at all along such a continuum as well? So we, are we sort of maybe they will develop a consciousness akin to lower animals and that sort of thing, John? Well, it's a very big topic and, and a complicated one. Um, there are many different ways in which you can sort of subdivide consciousness. Uh, but a common way is to make a difference between sentience and self-awareness. So there's no doubt that many animals are sentient, that they are, you know, if you do something unpleasant to them and you can see the face screw up or you can see them respond in a way, we assume that what's going on, their, their experience, the experience of, of, say, a dog, a cat, a horse, an elephant, a, a dolphin, is in some way analogous to what we feel like when something happens. And the whole foundation of animal welfare is based on the assumption that animals are sentient. Um, but we are much more than sentient. We are self-reflective. We're able to think about thinking you know we're mm. aware of what is going on in our minds at any one moment we can stand back and we can also read other people's minds i can work out that justin's getting increasingly bored by this conversation <laughs> just by looking at his face so uh, <laughs> but um so human consciousness the only kind of consciousness that we really understand is human and it's a human consciousness which comes out of having a body i mean if you think about it how did our consciousness emerge? Well, it emerged when we were a baby crashing around, mm. you know, sticking our fingers into things and then gradually working out other people, smiling at other people, they smile back at us. In other words, the emergence of consciousness is totally related to having a body and to exploring a physical universe. Now, how could a, a computer that sits with sending electrical currents to itself ever develop that kind of awareness that comes from an embodied mammalian mm. species exploring the world um if there is any kind of consciousness if it's even possible if it even makes any kind of philosophical sense i think what we would have to say is it must be utterly and totally different mm. from anything that we have any kind of concept about and as i say and my, my feeling on this to, to answer that question john is it would be really difficult to know whether you were dealing with something that was conscious because i'm sure we can all be fooled into thinking we're talking to a conscious thing but if you actually get behind it it's still ones and zeros and following algorithms and things it, it, it whether it understands it is a completely different question as to whether i i think it feels you know conscious in in the way it's responding to me but that, that that's my just my perspective that, that's right and, and i think the other thing which is and this is where the kind of the Christian perspective, because what's so interesting in Christian theology is this idea that the evil one is is a counterfeit. The evil one simulates um, what is genuine 
the evil is not genuinely creative, not genuinely uh, innovative, but rather than that it simulates. And I think, therefore, that we have reason to be cautious. We have reasons to be on our guard, not to be naive, that, that things that appear to be good, things that appear to be um, in, uh, to have human-like characteristics, we shouldn't be naive. That, that doesn't mean to say, you know, I, I think who knows what God in his purposes for the universe. Maybe there is, you know, God in has, has amazing plans for the future that we really have no awareness of. All we can be faithful to is the light we've been given at the moment. That's really helpful, John. I can certainly confirm that my puppy, for instance, does not have any self-reflection. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> what you were saying there about, uh, you know, evil, and we've talked quite a lot about kind of the dangers of technology. And I think that that comes really nicely to this question from Eva, who says you've talked about taking the evil possibilities of AI seriously. But what do you think are the main areas where AI could amplify good or even do a better job? I'm thinking of how in popular culture, the Terminator is often used as an example of evil. Evil, but in the sequel, Sarah Connor observes that the now reprogrammed robot is serving as the perfect father for her son, John. She sees that it will never stop and would even die to protect him. Um, and, and then this is a quote in an in in an sorry, this is a quote from the film in an insane world. It was the sanest choice. So, so what do you think are some of the areas where there's good being done? And is it sometimes, you know, that kind of blurry line, I suppose? Yeah, really interesting. I think the most obvious place where good is being done is at a much more boring level. It's things like, you know, uh, keeping the keeping uh, the chains of technology and so on working. So what's called logistics and so on. Uh, al already AI is making a massive difference to the efficiency of many firms, uh, things like uh, electrical grids, like uh, cooling uh, methods, like uh, so many different areas where so AI is working behind the surface and increasingly that's happening in healthcare. It's already happening that the AI is helping hospitals run more efficiently. I mean, you may think that the our current problems we have with the NHS, they're not doing an incredibly good job of it. But um, I, I, I think uh, we will see more and more of this sort of nuts and bolts stuff working behind the scenes. I mean, when it comes to caring, this is quite controversial. So there are some people who are, who are very, very positive about this. They say there just aren't enough people in the world to do mm. all the caring needs. You know, we've got so many older people. We've got so many uh, people with disabilities, problems of one some kind. Surely compassionate, caring robots are going to be the way forward. Um, and I... I can certainly see how valuable it would be to have something that can make the bed, um, change a baby's nappy safely, uh, do all the unpleasant things, which would allow human beings to do the, the things they were really good at. But once we're talking about a robot who is sort of helping someone who's lonely uh, or who finds it difficult to make human relationships and so on, I start to get really worried about that, you know, because it's, again, it's a kind of counterfeit. It's not genuinely this thing that smiles at you and says, oh, I do love you. Oh, I do like caring for you. It doesn't mean it at all. These are just words that have been programmed. And do we really want our most vulnerable mm. people, the people in society? I mean, the interesting thing is, why is there a shortage of human carers? Are there not enough human beings on the planet to do the caring? Well, answer there are. The reason is because the terms and conditions, the pay mm. and everything, the status is so low. If we were able to improve the pay and conditions and the status of carers, I think we could find more than enough human carers who wouldn't need to have machine carers. Yeah, it, it does feel like a sort of sad state of affairs when you've got when you've sort of effectively parceled out all your caring for people to, to to robots it feels like well what's the point of being here in the first place if we're just going to end up just talking to to non-humans you know for, for most of our lives but um trevor does have a comment on the back of eva's question there um and this is on the sort of the, the plus side of AI and so on. He says, following from Eva's question, if you do look at areas such as energy management, 
AI is now being used to optimize the settings applied to the heating, ventilating and air conditioning systems in buildings like offices, shopping centers and hotels. And the results seem to suggest that AI solutions do generate better results in terms of reducing energy consumption, improving the internal climate within a building. So there are reasons to be positive in such situations or do we think that's evil as well? Well, from everything you said, it sounds like you're saying, no, of course, there are good practical applications of AI, John. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, and I think this technology is a gift which God, you know, has allowed human beings to develop the expertise to, to develop this kind of thing. I like this Id the idea that technology should be redeemed. You know, the, 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 um, you don't just say, well, it's just great, let's use it. Because, of course, it's also been, uh, it has this evil possibilities within it. What we've got to learn is how to redeem it, how to take this technology and craft it and change it and redeem it. So it is really being used for God's purposes. But certainly I can see, you know, as I said before, how working on logistics, on efficiency, on improving um the smooth running of so much of our society. I think AI is just starting and it's going to become more and more effective at that. And I, I, mm. I think it is really going to improve healthcare, including things like diagnosis, um, uh, advising on, on new therapies, uh, monitoring people's conditions and so on. There's, there's a lot of potential for good here. Well, let's take a question from Paul here, who this is a really interesting kind of theological question. Paul says, if in the future the mind can be uploaded to a computer, what happens to the spirit in inverted commas? So I guess, you know, partly what, what do we mean by spirit? But but what happens in that case, John, do you think? Yeah, well, great question. Uh, so th this, of course, is pure science fiction. This this is a real example. This This is a science fiction idea that's been around for 50 years or more. The idea is we could take out the sort of the thinking bit and put it in a different medium. So, you know, the analogy is, okay, you've got this wonderful pop song. You can have it as a CD ROM. You can have it as a vinyl disc. You can have it uh, just purely as bits in, uh, in the cloud. It's the same song, but the information is instantiated as to use a posh word in different physical forms. And the idea is, well, why should it be true about human consciousness as well? You can have human consciousness in a body, but then we could put it into a robot or we could put it into the cloud. It's the same thing. The problem is it's pure science fiction and there's absolutely no evidence that it's ever going to be possible. And I don't think it's, I, in fact, I don't even think it makes philosophical sense because the own, as I said before, the only kind of consciousness we know is a mammalian consciousness. It's a consciousness which is wired into having a body. So mm. much of what, the way we experience, what we experience going on inside our heads is actually coming from our bodies. It's coming from all over. Uh, we're constantly uh, engaging physically uh, with emotions, with uh, all kinds of other things coming in from our bodies. So it just doesn't seem to make sense to say you could take all that and put it into silicon circuits and it would be the same thing uh, mm. i mean there are some people who are desperately wanting this to happen it's become a kind of new form of eternal life for materialists you know for people who say yeah. there's nothing out there except it, it's physics. become the sort of sci-fi version of heaven we is, can it? all live forever you know in a digital nirvana um but for me, the problem with that the whole concept is is it's it's got this huge philosophical question begging about it because it, it's it is just a sci-fi concept that you can take a consciousness and put it in this new me medium when all we all we know so far is that the only way we've been able to produce new consciousnesses is through pregnancy and birth uh, and that you know and we do not understand we don't have the first clue really what consciousness is i mean and there's a sort of naturalistic assumption at the heart of this sci-fi stuff that consciousness must just arise from purely physical arrangements of atoms and if you can just basically get that right in a digital form then you're on the road but we don't know that 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 is a big philosophical assumption they're making isn't it absolutely it is and then if you take the distinctively christian point of view not only are we have a consciousness which is embodied in a mammalian setting 
but God has chosen to use this consciousness or this mammalian phenomenon as a temple of the Holy Spirit. So in some extraordinary way, the Holy Spirit is capable of um, transforming, changing, uh, inspiring us. Um, so that I would understand it in a kind of holistic sense. It's not that we've got a bit of this, a bit of body, a bit of spirit, a bit of soul, all jangling around together. God treats us as this fully physical, fully psychological, fully relational, fully spiritual being. And he engages in his grace and mercy. Mm. He engages with us. He speaks to us. He transforms us. He lives his life through us. And we should celebrate that because that's something that no mechanical, it seems to me, um, no mechanism can ever approach the wonder of what it means to be human. We're, we've got a question here from uh, Marco, uh, Leanne, Noah and Naomi, perhaps all four of them watching tonight <laughs> on the live stream. Um, so love the show. Thank you. The rulers and principalities have been mentioned. Is AI, intrusive surveillance, the Internet of Things, 5G, are they not undeniably tools or weapons of this world that are perhaps building towards something like the mark of the beast, some kind of end times eschatological sort of situation? And uh, they go on to say, I love the cigarette analogy, but isn't the church sleeping at the wheel, you know, debating the micro detail rather than the actual causes and reasons? Well, the genuine reasons for these technologies are maybe being lied about. Again, they say China is an excellent example. Uh, what's is there an agenda behind this stuff and and could it be related almost to some of that that stuff in in revelation so what what are your th thoughts on all of that john well big big questions aren't they <laughs> um i do think that we have to be cautious and critical you know jesus said you understand whether you can say it's going to be sunny tomorrow you know or it's going to rain tomorrow but you don't understand the signs of the times so i think we do have to be thoughtful and critical about what's going on and trying to step back and again i i think that often unfortunately many it does seem as though many christians and church leaders are i think sleep at the wheel is a bit is a bit too negative but i think they're not really genuinely aware of the way that technology is accelerating us a most extraordinary pace and really not really thinking about the implications um and who knows what the future holds i mean i think what we do know is that god is ultimately in control that 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 god is not surprised by the development of chat gpt or any of this new technology and that actually in his providential purposes he can use this as part of the um of his plans i mean one of the th fascinating things to speculate about is you know it was often said that the invention of printing played a key role in the reformation and, and allowing um the good news and the gospel to be uh, printed and distributed around the world. Now, is it possible that the development of these internet technologies are allowing new uh, forms mm. of Christian witness? You know, the fact that we're having this webinar with people literally mm. around the world discussing and, and sharing and learning from one another, that, that would have been inconceivable even 20 years ago. So I, I, I don't think we need to be frightened or concerned you know, so often when God appears in a new way in the biblical narrative, the first words he says is, don't be afraid. Um, he is in control. He is the master. But we have got to be thoughtful and wise and be aware that evil can appear in all kinds of strange places. So we, I think we need to pray for discernment. We need to pray for wisdom. We need to support one another in trying to understand better what is happening and then how to respond from the perspective of the Christian faith. There's a question here from Carla, which I'm sure 
echo you know is echoed by lots of parents and and when we're talking about kind of technology and the ways that we can use it for good young people are definitely one of the categories that you think of you know the Instagram influencers who are reaching lots of young people and and things like that sort of going to where young people are but then I suppose there's the flip side of it so Carla says while the church catches up how do parents have good and effective conversations with their adolescents or children um, to maybe even avoid the eye rolling that tends to occur when you start to raise these concerns (laughs) and you know as a youth worker as a mom it's surely telling a young person to kind of switch off their phone not do that is like telling them to lose an arm is it is it not John you're a grandfather you know (laughs) what what would you say about that well I think it's an amazing challenge isn't it and and as a grandfather I look at these children and I'm thinking what on earth you know world are we bringing them into how are they going to learn to cope with technology um there are some excellent uh, resources out there already. A, a book that comes to my mind is called Tech Wise Family by Andy Crouch. Mm. And he's got a lot of very practical uh, down to earth suggestions and recommendations from his own experience as a, as, a, as a family, as a father. One of the most important things he says is the problem is for children and adolescents is that what's on my smartphone is so utterly fascinating. And, you know, all these amazing cat videos and TikTok and you name it, it's all there. And what mum and dad offer have to offer is frankly boring and staid. And as you say, eye rolling in comparison. And the challenge is what Andy Crouch says is that we've got to, as parents, we've got to be able to make what we have to offer family games, whatever it is, what we've planned for them this evening, even more interesting, even more exciting, even more Mm. uh, attractive than whatever's available on the smartphone. So that's our challenge as parents. We've got to compete. We've got to compete for our children's attention and interest, and we've got to generate or between us find ways of having things that are even more interesting, even more fun than TikTok. One of the things I've heard as well, which I think is really helpful, is getting the young people involved themselves. So lots of people have talked about having a kind of family contract around technology, which also means the parents don't do what they're asking the children not to do. But everyone has agreed to it. So it's very much a kind of unity based contract. It's not just parents are saying, don't do this. It's everyone's chipped in with what they think is a good idea, whether that's no phones at the table, all of that. But the children have come up with that as well. And therefore, they're beholden to the advice that they have put on themselves, which I think is quite helpful. I think that's absolutely right. Right. And of course, as we all know, the one thing that adolescents are exquisitely sensitive about is hypocrisy. And so if they sense that, yeah, my mum and dad, they say we shouldn't be doing that. But do you know what they're up to when, the, when we're not watching? So as you say, we have to agree together as families how we're going to support one another and why it's important, why family is so important that we're going to put it in front even of the smartphone. Mm. Luciana has, has a question here. Um, and it's it's again returning to that kind of question of big tech and the way countries might be using this um sounds like luciana has has a personal stake in this is says what to do when your country's government is unconstitutionally silencing and censoring anyone who goes against the government and that of course is happening increasingly through social media and that kind of thing these days and luciana says i'm afraid for my family back in my home country now doesn't tell us where that is but I mean that this is the dark side of all of this, isn't it? Where the, the, it does feel like the, the, there really is a certain amount of power now that large corporations, governments, and so on can wield because we're sort of so locked into our iPhones, and obviously so much of our media comes through it, and we're so influenced by it, um, and indeed it can be keeping tabs on us at the same time as well. So, what I mean, I, I'm sure you don't have the answer to this, job, but what? <laughs> What, where do you go with this? What what kind of would you like to see happening in the future to ensure that we don't go down that kind of dystopian kind of road? Yeah, there's there's lots of different sides to this, isn't there? I, I mean, one of the things that occurs to me is that, you know, down for 2000 years, many Christians have, have been, quotes, persecuted. They've been, it's not unusual for Christians to find themselves in a political or social environment, which is hostile. And, uh, you know, that has been happening for 2000 years. What's new is the sophistication of the technology which is being used. But I think we've Mm. got a lot to learn from Christians down the centuries who've been persecuted, who've been in hostile uh, settings. And of course, a lot of it is just learning to be smart. Um, and, And sometimes that means that you have to 
if you're in a very hostile environment, you have to find ways of protecting yourself or protecting your loved ones. And often that means, you know, using code. I know Christians in other countries who never use open Christian language and they always mm. refer to code and are using technology like VPNs, virtual private networks, ways of of evading or limiting surveillance. Um, at a public level, I do think we need, the, the Christians need to uh, speak out um, for other Christians. You know, when one part of the body mm. suffers, uh, the whole body suffers. And, and, and maybe we in the West have become so uh, complacent about the fact of freedom of speech and, and that we, we're allowed uh, to do and to say pretty much whatever we like. And we need to be prepared to stand up for our brothers and sisters around the world. Mm. And who knows what, what could happen in the future? We, you know, we, we shouldn't assume that this free internet um, and this freedom of speech we currently have in the West is going to persist indefinitely. I think it is perfectly possible that mm. at some time in the future, we are going to have to learn new techniques of how to uh, survive in, in a society and a political system which is trying to control and limit our activities. We're very nearly out of time, but this feels like a sort of appropriate last question. It's not really a question so much as a comment, but we'd love to know sort of what you think of this. This is from Russell, who says, we seem to be in a period where people are struggling with a lack of meaning. And I feel like AI might start doing a better job than we can at creative activities that used to make us feel good about ourselves, um, thus worsening the crisis. So I suppose, what are your thoughts about what Russell's saying there about meaning? And I guess I'd love to add, what, like, what's the church's responsibility to sort of speak meaning into those situations? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, shrewd and thoughtful point, really. I think it's absolutely right. We live in a, a culture where many people say, what's the point? You know, I, I've got material goods, I've got technology, but what's the point of living? What's, what's it all about? And the danger is that if we think technology is going to provide meaning and even this really sophisticated AI, I mean, as we've said before, it, it doesn't understand anything. Mm. There's no way that uh, AI or robotics is going to give any fundamental meaning. So where does meaning come from? Well, answer, ultimately, it comes from God, but it's God revealed in a human being, in Jesus Christ. And so humanity um original model not the new advanced <laughs> technologically um sophisticated humanity but original mark one humanity as we see in jesus is god's plan for us and that's ultimately where meaning comes and you know i think we there's going to be an aspect to say if that old-fashioned mark one humanity was good enough for jesus then it's good enough for us too we don't need this amazing new technology. And what we need to do is to find ways of being more human, more like Jesus. It's a great place to finish. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the great questions that came in this evening. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed hearing from John, uh, the answers. And and I hope that whatever your tech life looks like, that you're able to go out and, and live as a Christian a little bit more faithfully in a technologically confusing world. Just just a quick mention to say it is an excellent resource. John's new book, um, it's not that new, it actually came out a year or two back mm -hmm. now, didn't it? But the robot will see you now. Um, and we'll we'll make sure there is again a link to that from the chat. We're going to be following up this webinar with an email. So you'll you'll get the links anyway to John's website and such like too. Uh, also, just to re reiterate, um, if you'd like to support the work of Premier Unbelievable, bringing you uh, resources like this, uh, webinars, shows, podcasts, videos, courses, um, we would love you to get involved. We we're all about helping Christians to understand, defend and share their faith with confidence and also skeptics to explore the claims of faith as well. If you'd like to join us in that mission, uh, we would really be encouraged if you're able to to, to send a gift. Um, and we will uh, likewise uh, send a thank you gift if you're able to do that with the link from today's show. Uh, you'll get the e set, the ebook, uh, Robots, Transhumanism and Life Beyond Earth. This is the ebook of John's conversation with lord martin reese on the big conversation last year but there's over 100 pages actually of additional interviews and articles so you can really dig in in a big way to these issues 
Um, so if you're able to uh, uh, give a gift, uh, you will get that ebook uh, as a thank you for that. The link, as I say, is in the chat. Uh, you'll receive it on email. And if you're watching or listening at a later date to this show, it's still available with the info with today's show and you'll be able to, to get hold of it as well. Um, for now, um, let me just give you a quick heads up what's coming up next month on our next live show. Um, this is going to be an interesting one because we're going to be kind of doing our traditional unbelievable show format here with two different perspectives on our uh, next show. This is going to be on the 7th of February, sexuality, gender and identity, two views on LGBT and the church. Andrew Bunt will be joining us. Uh, he's the author of a new book. Um, Andrew is a same-sex attractive Christian, but holds to uh, a, a viewpoint where he believes actually he's called to a celibate lifestyle on the basis of his scriptural convictions. Charlie Bell is the author of another book recently, but he uh, is, is uh, affirming of gay relationships as a Christian. So this is going to be interesting discussion between these two guys. Uh, I hope you can join us for it. You can actually uh, register right away if you want to for that it's happening on tuesday the 7th of february be with us live and of course we'll have your questions as well for both our guests as part of that uh, again uh, the link is with the chat uh, or you'll get the link when we send a follow-up email and indeed there'll be a web page where you can find all this as soon as our call is over with john but for now john thank you so much for being such an amazing guest and answering all of his questions none of which you'd seen in advance far better than any ai could ever answer them <laughs> where you so. hope <laughs> absolutely and there's lots of lovely comments in the chat as well john thanking you and one in particular says they they feel a lot more peace now because of what you said so that's that's really good isn't it well god bless you all it's been it's amazing to be part of this uh, international community and and thanks for the privilege to be here well, God bless you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming along and spending the evening with us as well. And we hope you can join us again next time on the show. But for now, God bless you. And see you around. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.